In January of 2002, I became a professional wrestling fan. And since then, I've watched every single WrestleMania from WrestleMania 18 all the way through to tonight's WrestleMania 40. And I don't know if you can tell in my voice, but I'm a little bit emotional because I firmly believe that we just witnessed the greatest professional wrestling show ever. Especially if you include both nights and you include NXT Stand and Deliver, this was the greatest weekend of professional wrestling ever. I don't love starting the video by telling you that this is the greatest WrestleMania of all time because I'm basically spoiling my opinion here. But I do sincerely hope that you stick around because I'm gonna be reviewing WrestleMania 40 night two. I'm gonna be going through every single match. I'm gonna dissect what I thought and tell you overall whether or not I liked it. And then we'll sum up the whole show and give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And as always, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, ring the bell for notifications. If you're a wrestling fan, I know you're gonna fall in love with this YouTube channel because we always upload daily wrestling content. And I do wanna say thank you to everyone that came to the watch along with us because we had over 20,000 people there. We got to watch history unfold. I remember when I was in college watching wrestling by myself with no one to share my thoughts with. Specifically, I remember when The Undertaker lost his streak and I couldn't share my emotions with anyone. But this time we got to witness professional wrestling history and I was surrounded by wrestling nerds like me and you to gush about it with. So sincerely from the bottom of my heart, thank you for giving me that opportunity. So let's gush some more. In yesterday's review, I basically clowned on the Philadelphia crowd. Well, I can tell you right now, folks, that the Philadelphia crowd heard the complaints, heard that everyone was clowning on them, and they came back harder than ever before because that was an incredibly electric WrestleMania crowd from beginning to end. This is actually the WrestleMania crowd that has now made it so that open roof stadiums no longer have this excuse that, oh, well, you know, it's not as loud because of the open roof. Nah, nah. Now you have to watch WrestleMania 40 night two to see what open roof stadium crowds can sound like because that crowd was immaculate. Take a freaking bow, Philadelphia crowd. You help make tonight's WrestleMania absolutely amazing. So from me to you, I want to formally apologize for doubting your game after what wasn't a very great performance on night one, crowd of Philadelphia. So now let's jump into things match by match. And let's start with the World Heavyweight Championship match between Seth frickin' Rollins defending the World Heavyweight Championship against Drew McIntyre. And both of these guys got their grandiose WrestleMania style entrance with Drew McIntyre making his way through a group of, of Scottish Highlanders all holding up swords and eventually bowing as Drew McIntyre walked past them. As well, uh, he was played in by a group of bad Bagpipers. Is that the proper term for them? Bagpipers? And then Seth Rollins also got a really great entrance as well, which was bizarre. I compared it to what looked like a World of Warcraft clan running around doing a dungeon. They were the Mummers group of Philadelphia. Anyways, they had all kinds of instruments like trumpets. They had accordions and they played Seth Rollins to the ring. There was like 70 of them that walked out with him. He kind of looked like Adam Rose <laughs> with his rosebuds with that WrestleMania entrance. But honestly, he he looked drippy. He had his awesome WrestleMania attire. Everyone around him was dressed like a clown, as CM Punk was saying, as well as Pat McAfee. Uh, so overall, I did like the entrances. We also had CM Punk on commentary for this match, who was absolutely brilliant, doing his best job at helping get the storyline between these two over, while also being absolutely hilarious and roasting both of them whenever he got a chance. But the match immediately started off with a bang, because right when the bell rang, Drew McIntyre hit Seth Rollins with a nasty claymore and we're thinking oh no this is a burial we are getting a Seth Rollins that is just so beaten and battered that he's just walking in here eating a claymore and that's it that's all she wrote and no that doesn't go over well with fans we saw it with Daniel Bryan and Sheamus all the way back in Wrestlemania 28 but I'm happy to tell you that this wasn't one of those cases in fact this match went on for double digit minutes now the match really ultimately was a finisher fest it was more or less just going back and forth between these guys uh, with close calls, close pins, uh, claymores, we had pedigrees, we had future shock DDTs, we have stomps, and it was all about like the super close calls. And I'm usually not a big fan of finisher fest, but this one for some reason worked especially well. And I think it was because of the visual frustration
frustration between both of these guys that couldn't do anything to put each other away. You could see the frustration in Drew McIntyre and you could see the frustration in Seth Rollins. So they were doing a hell of a job of acting and getting us emotionally involved in what they were feeling in that moment in the ring. Like quite seriously, they were hitting each other with every single possible finisher that they had. And it was just a constant rinse and repeat of that, but I liked it. I gotta give Drew McIntyre an extra bonus thumbs up here because of his extra character work. At one point, he grabbed his wife's phone and tweeted in the middle of the match, LOL bored at work, which was absolutely hilarious. He also had a lot of banter back and forth with CM Punk, who again was on commentary and was fantastic for this match. And what started as a finisher fest ended as a finisher fest as Drew McIntyre had to hit Seth Rollins with back-to-back -back claymores to finally put him away to finally win the big one. Drew McIntyre finally got his WrestleMania moment until. What's funny is that Drew McIntyre would then go out and just mock and berate CM Punk to the point where CM Punk finally snaps and starts beating the piss out of Drew McIntyre. In fact, he completely removed his uh, guard for his arm for his torn tricep, perhaps hinting that CM Punk's recovery is going way better than expected. So I'm expecting CM Punk to maybe be ready for something like Money in the Bank in Toronto, maybe Bash in Berlin, or maybe as late as SummerSlam. And it's poetic, really, what's about to happen, because not only did Drew McIntyre get his big moment, but Drew McIntyre's entire narrative was that he was angry at Seth Rollins for not paying attention, for not being mentally ready, for being overly obsessed with something else that didn't matter in the bloodline, as opposed to being focused on being a fighting champion. And what happened here? The second that Drew McIntyre finally won, he took his eyes off the ball he became overly obsessed with CM Punk as opposed to being obsessed with being a champion, which is what he should have been right then in that moment. Because after CM Punk laid the beat down on him, <laughs> Damian Priest music hits. He runs down faster than I've ever seen anyone run. The fastest cash in that I've ever seen because this referee did not go, you sure? Are you, are you sure you want to do this? Are you positive that you want to cash in? No, no, no. This ref is like, okay, I get you, Damian. We're cashing this in right now. Damien hits a beautiful South of Heaven choke slam, gets the victory and steals the title from Drew McIntyre, who was champion for all of five minutes. This was brilliant. The match, honestly, because it was a finisher fest, I wouldn't give it more than like an 8.5 out of 10 because it was still really, really fun. But the interactions that happened afterwards between CM Punk and Drew McIntyre, the cash-in, when you encapsulate all of that, what a brilliant way to start WrestleMania 40. Right then and there, I knew that we were in for a hell of a show. 40, 40 thumbs up for WrestleMania 40 for the first segment. This was absolutely fantastic. Do you want even more wrestling content? Because you're going to get more wrestling content over on my Patreon, patreon.com slash Santi's app. You're going to get the raw reviews. So the raw after mania review is going to be exclusive to Patreon. You're going to get the SmackDown reviews and you get the wrestling is cool podcast three days earlier than everyone else on this planet. So go check it out. Patreon.com slash Santi's app. The link will be in the description. Okay, back to the video now. Next up, we have the Philadelphia street fight between Bobby Lashley and the Street Profits taking on the final testament of Karrion Cross, Akam, and Razar. There were a couple of special announcements for this match that really added to the overall fun. Uh, we had Snoop Dogg being announced as a guest commentator who was absolutely hilarious. We need more Snoop Dogg on commentary, but then we also had the special treat of Bubba Ray Dudley of ECW Original from Philadelphia being announced as the special guest referee for the street fight. Honestly, it was it was pretty cool the street fight itself was fine like it wasn't anything crazy I, I wish they had done a lot more but everyone got to look good it got violent we had the kendo sticks all members got to do something cool at some point or another definitely the coolest thing was Montez Ford flying from one corner of the ring to the outside nearly flying over the freaking barricade that was badass but honestly the two most badass people in this match wasn't any of the guys in the actual match. It was Scarlet and B-Fab. Scarlet got in there and she was using kendo sticks to try and take out Bobby Lashley. B-Fab got in there and started evening out the odds and even put Scarlet through a table where they both went through it. Shout out to Scarlet and B-Fab. I feel like they really made the most out of their, their, their small spot at WrestleMania. But yeah, there's nothing particularly like too special about this. It really was just a quick to the point car wreck that was fun. We did have a quick nostalgia pop 
pop with Karrion Cross getting mad that Bubba Ray Dudley didn't count the three fast enough. And then Karrion Cross starts pushing Bubba Ray Dudley only for Bubba Ray Dudley to grab and in, uh, go into his pocket and grab his old ECW glasses because he had just awoken Bubba Ray Dudley. Now Bubba doesn't actually get physically involved. He actually is giving instructions to the Street Profits as to how to do the what's up to really get that extra ECW pop. The match even had a botched ending, but honestly, even then it was an endearing botch ending because they put Karrion Cross on a table and Montez was gonna do a frog splash, but uh, the table wasn't set up properly. So as soon as Karrion Cross lied on it, it broke. So they had to go and get another table, do it again with a beautiful, amazing Montez Ford frog splash where he got like 35 feet of air to put Karrion Cross through the table for Bobby Lashley to get the pin. Look, it was fun. It, this is probably the low light of the show, but I still liked it more than Jimmy versus Jey Uso because at the very least, this match knew what it was. It was quick and it was just a, a quick little burst of, of, of extreme. I enjoyed it. It still gets a thumbs up from me. Next up, we have LA Knight taking on AJ Styles. And AJ Styles got to debut a new entrance theme and I'd like to get your opinion on it. Let me know down in the comments below whether you like or dislike AJ Styles' new entrance theme. But this was another match that was really elevated by the crowd. The crowd was rowdy for AJ Styles and LA Knight from beginning to end. Funny enough, they were rowdy for things outside of the match because I guess the stadium turned on a light that made it really difficult to see what was happening in the ring. So people in the arena, like the entire arena was chanting things like, we can't see and turn the light off. The crowd was having a tremendous amount of fun, even if they paid good money to not see shit. But the actual match itself, I'm happy to tell you, was a really good match. It wasn't just a good match for AJ Styles and LA Knight. I think it was a good match to be on WrestleMania. And I loved how it started because AJ Styles doesn't just walk out to the ring. As soon as he's close enough to see LA Knight, he sprints down the ramp and these guys start just wailing on each other. It also seems like LA Knight saved his most innovative offense for this particular match because this man pulled off a springboard DDT. He also did a German suplex on AJ Styles from the top rope and flipped him on his face. That was awesome. There was also a moment where they exposed the concrete. It wasn't concrete, but like we're supposed to believe that they exposed the concrete and AJ Styles slams LA Knight onto it. And I'm not usually a huge fan of the really close, oh my God, the babyface gets back into the ring at the nine count but they did one of those and it weirdly got a pop out of me. I was super hyped that LA Knight was able to beat the 10 count of all things. This is a match where I really felt like it needed a stipulation with how much these guys hated each other. I feel like maybe a cage match would have been good or a street fight or something, but then again, maybe this match didn't need it because I still really enjoyed it at the end of the day. I love that the crowd was into it from beginning to end. AJ Styles looked good. LA Knight looked good. I love the ending with the BFT. AJ Styles sold the hell out of it because the BFT to me is typically a really shitty looking move, but AJ Styles made it look real good. So I'm gonna give this a thumbs up as well. Shout out to LA Knight. First ever WrestleMania and the man delivered one of his better matches in my opinion. I just hope that you guys can now maybe realize that that's this wasn't a demotion for LA Knight. He was on the WrestleMania card for his first time ever. Let him enjoy the moment against a bona fide legend of this business in AJ Styles. Not everything has to be for titles. Titles will come for LA Knight. They absolutely will. The company clearly trusts him and AJ Styles and LA Knight delivered a really great match in its own right. Thumbs up. Next up, we have the triple threat for the United States Championship in a match between Logan Paul going in as the champion versus Kevin Owens and Randy Orton. Up to this point, this to me was the match of the night because it was a tremendous amount of fun. It all started with the great entrances. We had Logan Paul come in with his incredibly obnoxious prime truck with a prime cannon where he's shooting and we're getting fireworks coming out of it. Uh, and he's coming out with another dancing prime bottle, which leads you to ask, okay, who's in the costume again? Is it gonna be KSI or is it gonna be Jake Paul? And then Kevin Owens had his cool entrance just like Sami Zayn where he came from the back and the camera followed him and Sammy was waiting for him right at the entrance and, and got him hyped up. I think that was a really neat moment. And then Kevin Owens grabs his golf cart, rides down to the ring, but then Randy's music hits and Kevin Owens puts it in reverse, 
tells Randy to get in. They ride back into the ring and just start beating the piss out of Logan Paul. Because the first five minutes of this match is just the, the utter annihilation and destruction of Logan Paul. It was basically just a handicap match. At one point after the major beatdown of Logan Paul, who was doing everything in his power to try and get Kevin Owens and Randy Orton to actually fight each other, eventually Randy Orton and Kevin Owens agree, okay, let's fight each other, let's do this right now, and then it became a proper triple threat match from there. This was a very good triple threat match on its own right. Is it as good as Obafemi, Dijak, and Josh Briggs? I don't think so, but to be frank, I feel like that's the pinnacle of triple threat matches at this point. But I loved just about every single off offensive sequence here because there were numerous moments where all three guys were bouncing amongst one another hitting each other with finisher transitioning into into signature moves it was honestly like a really really free-flowing triple threat match Randy Orton was looking like a million bucks he had a beautiful RKO where Kevin Owens threw him up for a pop-up powerbomb only for Randy Orton to come down with a majestic RKO and as Randy Orton is about to hit Logan Paul with a punt who gets involved but the goddamn prime bottle who pull who pulls logan paul away from danger and the reveal was i show speed for god's sake now in the world of professional wrestling i show speed is uh, an unknown but he is a massive social media megastar in his own right on youtube and just about everywhere that he's online but it was really random but i was like okay Hey, I'm down for it. If this becomes a yearly bit where some social media superstar that Logan Paul is friends with is in the prime suit, I'm here for it. And I show speed, I guess, is known for barking at people. And as soon as he revealed himself, he starts barking at Randy Orton and pushes him. Only for, <laughs> only, sorry, I'm laughing just thinking about it. Only for Randy Orton to just Spartan kick him right into oblivion. Then Randy puts him on the table, grabs him by the face, and Randy goes, oh, 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 and starts barking at I Show Speed, and it's a beautiful RKO onto the table. Shout out to I Show Speed. I feel like he, he was a ridiculously good addition to this. But that was enough time for Logan Paul to really recover in the final sequence there where they're all countering each other's finishers. They're all countering who's grabbing the brass knuckles, who's hitting who with the brass knuckles. Ultimately, Logan Paul is able to take advantage of the fact that Randy hit that beautiful RKO from the pop-up powerbomb because Logan Paul throws Randy out of the ring, hits uh, Kevin Owens with a beautiful, almost like a modified frog splash because he was just doing a bunch of things with his hands and, and his feet uh, to ultimately pick up the victory. This was a fun chaos. I love this match. Up, Like I said, up to this point, it was my favorite match of the night. So yes, this gets uh, so many thumbs up as well. And then we got Bayley and Io Sky in a singles match for the WWE Women's Championship. Bayley got a special entrance looking like Queen Nefertiti or somebody from Egyptian times as she was carried by uh, four men that are probably gonna be future WWE world champions into, into the ramp. And then she got a new entrance theme as well, which is pretty neat. But man, the aura of Io Sky's entrance, it was nothing special. It was just, it was just, I don't know. It's just a regular EO Sky entrance that worked especially well in that WrestleMania stage that made her feel special. But shout out to EO Sky. She did not come down with anyone from damage control. She went into this war completely by herself. And I'm of the mind that this was a bona fide classic of women's wrestling. In fact, I dare say that at this point, it was better than the triple threat match between Logan, Kevin, and Randy. When I look at it from a technical point of view, this was a masterpiece of professional wrestling. We had some incredibly innovative offense from Bailey, who was pulling out some moves that I had never seen before. Io Sky being the goddess of the skies that she's known for being, hitting so many moonsaults, either from, from inside of the ring to the outside or her patented moonsault. And there was even a sequence where she hit a triple moonsault from the bottom of the turnbuckle to the middle to the top. That was awesome. But there were so many awesome back and forths and reversals that at one point when you squinted, it sort of felt like we were watching a Daniel Bryan match. They even have this awesome sequence of, of Io Sky continuously countering everything that Bailey does and putting her into a crossface, even countering the top rope Macho Man elbow drop, catching her while on the ground and putting her in the crossface. But the magic of this match really came from the close pinfalls of Io Sky just coming inches away from putting away Bailey, but Bailey's resilience allowing her 
to kick out. The finishing sequence had everyone hitting their finishers. I love the fact that Bailey hit a clean rose plant on EO Sky for EO Sky to actually kick out of it as well. But that was enough for Bailey to have enough of an upper hand to hit another Macho Man elbow drop and to hit EO Sky with yet another rose plant to pick up the victory, a much deserved victory. Bailey absolutely deserved their flowers. EO Sky deserved their flowers in this match. It's possible that I might come away from this thinking that this may have been better than Rhea Ripley versus Charlotte. I thought that this match was fantastic. I might be overrating it right now. It might be recency bias, but the fact that I'm even comparing it to that match should tell you that this is a classic in women's wrestling. This is a thumbs up. And then folks, to end the show, we have arguably the greatest main event in professional wrestling period. Cody Rhodes taking on Roman Reigns for the WWE Undisputed Universal Championship. And right from the rip, you knew that this was special because Cody Rhodes got an awesome entrance, got to come up with Brandy Rhodes, with which right off the bat, you just knew that this was going to be a special match because of the star power that was coming out as both of them got amazing, cool WrestleMania entrances with Roman Reigns getting played by an entire orchestra, feeling like Ganondorf from The Legend of Zelda, like the final boss. I guess not the final boss. That's 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 still The Rock. Uh, but then Cody Rhodes got to come out to, to like a, a new, more violent version of himself because there were these like w bloody war banners and, and fire and he was wearing this this kingdom skull mask and he even got to come out with Brandy. Ah, it was it was su two superstars, man. I was getting chills watching their entrance. But here's the thing. This was two matches. These was entirely two separate tales here. And I'm happy to say that this wasn't your traditional bloodline match where it starts off super slow. I dare say that this was high octane right from the get go because we even had like right in the beginning, these guys going to the outside, taking advantage of the fact that it was bloodline rules, um, putting each other through tables, using weapons. Like they, they, they took advantage of the fact that this was bloodline rules and it wasn't just, okay, we're only going to get violent and, and super fast paced towards the end. Like I, I feel like it was fast paced right from the beginning. There were moments that allowed Roman Reigns to play that character where he's trash talking as he's beating people up my favorite of his trash talks came when he hit cody rhodes with a crossroads but then cody rhodes kicked out at 2.9 to which roman reign turns to paul Heyman and says see this is a garbage move ain't nobody winning with this move which i thought was absolutely brilliant but yeah they were like stealing each other's finishers in this first portion of the match with cody rhodes I think maybe hit more spears in this match than Roman Reigns did weirdly enough. So the actual first portion of this match that was just Roman Reigns and Cody Rhodes in my eyes was fantastic in its own right. It didn't need all of the crazy other overbooking stuff that happened afterwards, which made this amazing. But if that stuff didn't happen, if this was just Cody Rhodes versus Roman Reigns, they put together a really, really intriguing, fantastic main event calendar match but this wasn't just any match this was end game this was the end of the bloodline story this was bloodline rules and after having a traditionally very good five-star match shit just hits the fan because Cody Rhodes is about to put Roman Reigns away with the classic triple crossroads that he tried to win with at WrestleMania 39. But as he's about to hit the third, of course, a member of the bloodline gets involved. The first one being Jimmy Uso. And then from here, there's no turning back because this is adrenaline in our soul because Jay Uso comes out, they start brawling, they start fighting in the ramp. And then Jay Uso spears Jimmy from the top of the ramp they fall what looked like 10 feet through a set of tables which was absolutely insane in fact that like three minute brawl that they had was more interesting and way better than their entire WrestleMania night one match. But now that Jimmy was taken out, then Cody Rhodes once again has Roman Reigns exactly where he wants him and goes to hit again the triple crossroads only for finally Solo Sokoa to come out. Solo Sokoa then hits Cody Rhodes with the with the Samoan spike but Roman Reigns tries to pin him, but he kicks out at 2.9. Then Solo screams at Roman to, hey, let's finish this, spear him right now. And they do the spear into the spike combination only for Cody Rhodes to again kick out. It was insane. And as Solo is about to cause even more pain and more carnage in the ring on Cody Rhodes, 
John Cena's music hits and he sprints down to the ring, takes out Roman Reigns with an attitude adjustment, goes after Solo Sokoa, takes out Solo Sokoa, puts Solo Sokoa through a table. Jesus Christ. And then from here, it is quite seriously a thousand miles an hour because immediately after Cena hits the attitude adjustment through the table on Solo Sokoa, The Rock's music hits and John Cena's face, Oh, it's hard to explain. There was a, a combination of, of excitement, but shock and, and fear as well. As Cena went into the ring to meet The Rock and The Rock slides into the ring and they have their stare down. And I nearly went into tears because those are my two favorite WWE superstars of all time. I am one of those lucky individuals that got their dream match. A lot of people don't get to say that. I got Rock versus Cena, not once, not twice, but I got it again. I got it a third fucking time. And The Rock hit Cena with a rock bottom screaming at him what the fuck are you doing here get the fuck out of here i'm the i'm the final boss get out of the final boss's ring and then the rock goes to start whipping people and then the shields music hit for god's sake and i'm thinking there's no way that these guys got both seth rollins and dean ambrose to come out to the shield theme unfortunately that was the one area of this where we didn't get the payoff that maybe we were hoping for because Dean Ambrose, Moxley, he's still over in AEW, but we did have Seth come out in full shield gear, but he was immediately taken out by Roman Reigns. And once again, as The Rock was about to start whipping people and start whipping Cody Rhodes, wouldn't you freaking know it, The Undertaker's gong hits, darkness involves it engulfs the ring, the, the lights come back on, Undertaker's behind the rock. He takes out the rock with a choke slam. The lights go off again. And I guess the Undertaker dragged the rock into the abyss into hell. I don't know, man, but I was marking out. And after the Undertaker took out the rock and made them disappear, took them back to Hawaii or something. Then we were back to just Roman and Cody Rhodes in the ring. And this is where things become quite literally cinema folks because roman reigns then grabs a chair and is about to beat down cody with it to grab the victory but who's the other person in the ring who has his back turned to roman reigns it's seth rollins in shield gear and instead of hitting cody rhodes with the chair Roman Reigns decides to finally pay back Seth Rollins for the plan B. And he hits Seth Rollins with a nasty chair shot to the back, exactly mirroring how Seth Rollins hit Roman Reigns all of those years ago to break up the shield. It was magic. And here's the poet in me that noticed all this because Seth Rollins kept his promise. He said, let me be your shield. Seth Rollins was out there in shield gear and shielded Cody Rhodes from the chair shot that would have made him lose this match. If Seth Rollins doesn't shield Cody Rhodes from that chair, Roman Reigns probably would have retained. And Seth shielding Cody Rhodes gave Cody Rhodes enough time to recover to counter the spear and finally hit an uninterrupted triple crossroads. No bloodline members left to interrupt it to finally pick up the victory and end the most historic title reign in the modern era of professional wrestling. I got to witness history with you and 20,000 other people. We got to witness the end of one of the greatest storylines of professional wrestling in the bloodline narrative, but the start of an entire new era of professional wrestling as well, the Paul Levesque era. And like I said, the first half of this was just a regular, really good, in my opinion, five-star match. And then the back half was when all the crazy overbooking happened. And that turned to me a five-star match into a 17 and a half star match, in my opinion. Well, I guess it wasn't in the Tokyo Dome. So it's like 16 stars. But everything about this man, the story, the actual match, the shocks, the surprises, the emotions, the cinema, it was perfect, perfect, right down to the last minute detail. And Cody Rhodes finished his story, celebrated with the pyro, and every other person that was also involved in some capacity with the bloodline, from LA Knight to Randy Orton to Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens, all came out to hoist Cody Rhodes up into the air 
to celebrate. And yeah, everybody that got involved physically in that match had history with Roman Reigns or the Bloodline. We have John Cena who goes as far back as having matches with Roman Reigns in 2017. We of course had Jey Uso, the Bloodline Civil War. We have The Undertaker getting in there who lost to Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 33. It was the ghost of everything that Roman Reigns had accomplished and destroyed throughout his career. It was... It was a movie, dude. It was a fucking movie. We even got a beautiful moment with Cody Rhodes being able to finally present the championship, not to Dusty because he died, but to his mom. And that was a promise that he made. And it was beautiful. Cody even grabbed the mic, demanded that Triple H and Bruce Pritchard come out because they were incredibly instrumental to him coming back to the WWE and giving us the moment that we just got to witness. This... I don't even want to give this a thumbs up. I want to, I, like, this is the greatest thing that I've ever seen in professional wrestling ever. So I guess, yeah, thumbs up. Folks, I don't know if you're as emotional as I am. I, I, I'm, I'm still kind of at a loss for words. Uh, so thank you so much for sticking with me for throughout this entire year of posting YouTube videos and streaming and posting TikToks. I can't wait to go through this journey with you again, all the way through to WrestleMania 41. But once again, I'm done. Get out of here.